Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Jason. That was um, a perfect way to start the day. Um, and just out of curiosity, last night at, uh, at the end of our keynote, I charged you all to uh, go outside and allow yourself to wonder for a moment outdoors. Did anyone take advantage of that? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm so thankful to see you all um, enjoying the outdoors. That's what this Biophilia Symposium is all about. It is about appreciating that connection between us and our wild world. And uh, I'm glad you all were able to take advantage of that as well. Um, as I said before, my name is Dr. Maria Wheeler Dubas. I am our Science Education Outreach Manager here at Phipps. I normally coordinate a lot of our biophilia programs, like our monthly meetups and our environmental film series. And I know I've seen a lot of you at those um, biophilia events, so we're excited to have this entire day focused solely on this concept. Um, I'll be moderating our first session today. This is our sense of place session. The way our sessions are going to roll today, um, you probably saw this in your, um, in your itinerary, but we're going to have three to four speakers per session, and then we're going to have a moderated panel at the end of those sessions. So you'll see um, a moderator will come up, and you'll notice at your table there are pens and little slips of paper. So if you have questions for any of the speakers, you can write your questions on those pieces of paper. And as the panel's getting started, you'll notice a number of FIPS staff around the room that will be coming to collect those questions. So just hold your question up in the air uh, at the end of all the speakers, and um, they'll come collect those questions for the, um, the panel discussion at the end. Um, so, all right, well, we'll get started. So our first speaker this morning is going to be Dr. Tim Beatley. Dr. Beatley is the Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities and the Chair of the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, where he has taught for the last 30 years. Beatley is also the author or co-author of more than 15 books, and he is the founder of the International Biophilic Cities Network. So let's all thank, uh, welcome Dr. Beatley up to the stage. Okay, thank you, Maria. Good to, good to see you. Good morning, everybody. Um, let's see if I can figure out this clicker. Uh, so Richard's mentioned a couple of times about the Biophilic Cities uh, network and the concept of Biophilic Cities, and I'm not really going to talk so much about that today. Hopefully, you'll learn about it over the course of the day. I know Rebecca Kiernan is going to be with us later, and she is a person from the city of Pittsburgh who has been our collaborator uh, on this network. And, the city of Pittsburgh is in the network, we're happy to say, and we're up to about 22 cities, but you'll learn more about that. So to, in the 17 minutes or so that I have, or 18 minutes, um, I want to, actually this works well, Maria, wherever you are, you set it up nicely. Uh, this is maybe a continuation of your challenge from last night and, and today. So I want to specifically talk about this idea of awe. And is there such a thing as a city that is designed to maximize moments of awe? Uh, that is, in fact, one possible definition of what a biophilic city is. And it's an intriguing one, really. And awe, by awe, uh, I mean, there are, you know, wonder. There are other ways to say it. I love this. This is a UVA class of mine. I love that expression. Um, that is often. Uh, what the awe evokes, right? Um, there are definitions we could cite. Um, this is from Rich Louv's new, wonderful new book, Our Wild Calling. Um, what is awe? It's something surprising, something you didn't expect. It's something that conveys a sense of vastness, right? It's something that propels you, in a sense, outside of your normal life and makes you feel a little bit humble. Uh, in the world compared to everything else. And that's a kind of experience that we want to have uh, in cities. And here, I, I like to say it's a constellation of, of terms, wonder, curiosity, discovery, fascination, radical amazement would be uh, some other words to say. And it leads to a lot of other things and uh, so-called pro-social behavior. Empathy and compassion, actually. Turns out we have a little bit of evidence. There's more work going on now than ever before around the effects of awe. I'm just going to give you two slides to give you a little bit of a taste of what that, that evidence is showing. This is a group from Stanford, and uh, I've done some really interesting studies to expose people to conditions of awe and then sort of understand what, uh, what that means to them and, and how it affects their, their behavior. Uh, no question that we get a boost in life satisfaction, that it's pleasurable to have experiences of awe. Um, it's really interesting, though, that in the this, this Stanford study, they're finding that actually the sense of time 
changes, uh, changes. We feel we have more time, actually, in the presence of awe, and, and we feel inclined to want to help other people, and we want to actually give our time um, to a larger purpose. So that's really interesting and the kind of city, really, that we want to, um, we want to design and, and plan. This is a, a second study, Paul uh, Piff um, from, um, from Irvine, California. Yeah, awe, uh, finding that generosity, kindness, and other pro-social behaviors are associated with conditions of awe. And I actually love the methodology where they take uh, folks into the forest to, to induce a sense of awe which is a, a wonderful experimental technique, but as a city planner, I'm thinking, well, that's what we have forests and cities for. That's part of, we can do that. We can actually design cities to induce uh, moments of awe through the course of the day. So that's, uh, this is my main point. Um, biophilic cities, you're gonna hear more about the, na the natureful cities, cities that put uh, nature at the core of their uh, design and planning um, so that we're living and working in, in nature immersive environments. But another way to think of it is cities that work to expand and maximize moments of awe. Well, how do we do that? And here's sort of the Pecha Kucha lightning part. I'm gonna, I've got a lot of slides, too many to cover probably in the time that I have. I think it's important for us to be teaching awe. Um, Stephen Keller liked to say that biophilia was a, is a weak genetic tendency, and he didn't mean it was not important or, or a, str a strong innate uh, uh, inclination, but we need to exercise it. We need to cultivate it. It's within us all. The ability to experience awe, to look for it, to see it, is a, is a, is a teachable thing. So this is actually a, a number of the slides here um, ha are from films that we've made, are making. This is a wonderful part of a film called uh, Ocean Cities, uh, about connecting cities to oceans. And we followed a group of fifth graders out into the Atlantic Ocean. It's part of a, a nature center um, experience. Uh, Metro Dade County School System actually cycles all their students through this nature center and they, they have this kind of experience. And it was wonderful to see the kids each uh, pair of kids given a, a little net and, and encouraged to scoop the bottom of the water and pull up what they could find. And with the help of a naturalist walking out into the ocean with them, identifying the nature there. And it was, it was, a, it was an awe-inspiring awe moment for me, but it was wonderful to see the sort of reactions of, of kids who had, most of them had never been to the ocean before, never had that visceral connection to it. And so at one point, um, a child pulls up their net and there's this thing that looks like an inflated tennis ball. And it turns out to be a puffer fish. And the, the oohs and ahs, and they put it back. There's a little floating, a little floating tank to hold things. And it returns to you know, what the kids thought a fish looked like. And that was another a moment of awe uh, for them, that a, that a fish could actually do that. So we need to provide lots of opportunities for this, and we are in many places, and sometimes it happens through events like BioBlitz, 24 or 48-hour um, intensive you know, inventories of the biodiversity that exists in a city or a part of a city or a park. This is a, um, a San Diego BioBlitz that we filmed a few years ago. This is the Moth Station run by kids. Um, a, a wonderful opportunity to in induce learning and awe We've been looking for very creative things that cities are doing to make nature visible and to make that awe that's around us, but we may not be able to see it. So this is actually a short film on our webpage um, about a, a wonderful event called Peer Into the Night in, in the Northwest in Washington, in Gig Harbor. And this nonprofit actually organizes, but puts up a screen on their public pier and then volunteer divers go into the water at night and they a little, have a little Go, GoPro camera and a couple of lights and they send back in real time images of what they're seeing underwater. And there's a naturalist uh, on top the, next to the screen kind of showing everybody what is being seen. And it is wonderful, was wonderful to see the oohs and ahs in that case um, as well. Um, but it is things like education centers. This is from another film, um, a wonderful marine education center in Wellington, New Zealand. Wellington is one of our partner cities in the network. Uh, just giving kids the chance at a young age to see and, and appreciate, touch, experience the 
wondrous nature uh, around them. Um, we've, I've become convinced that we've got to actually engage folks actively in the restoration of nature, and that that's part of what the awe-inducing in effect is. So this is from another short film on our webpage about burrowing owl restoration in, in Phoenix. It's a wonderful story. You see the image is a little bit cut off on the right. Um, this was a day where citizens came out to help um, construct and install artificial underground burrows for burrowing owls. And during that day, um, this little guy uh, was quite interested and was flying around. And um, you know, it was a li little bit of an interruption to the work pattern of uh, the volunteers, but it was a moment of wonder. I think most of the volunteers had never actually seen a burrowing owl before, <laughs> nevertheless appreciated that they were all around and all around them where they're living uh, in, in Phoenix. Uh, but there are lots of ways of doing that, lots of ways of engaging people directly in hands-on activities. Um, there are images from a wonderful program called Parabotanists, where um, citizen botanists are trained. This is through the San Diego Museum of Natural History. They learn to go out and take specimens, scientific uh, level grade mm. specimens, and um, it, it's really an essential part of understanding the biodiversity. I'm a big believer in what I call magical maps. We, we are very good at generating lots of GIS, wonderful, data-rich, complex GIS maps. But I think to induce the kind of feelings of awe in cities, we've got to rethink our strategies for mapping. This is not a perfect example, but our friend um, Catherine Warner, the sustainability director in St. Louis, helped to generate this connecting to nature map for that city. And it has butterfly uh, gardens and a lot of cool things. And if you're a kid and you see butterflies on the map, um, that's a place you want to go see and you want to seek out. So I think we need to do a better job at conveying, this is again another making the wondrous nature in a city visible. That's got to be a big part of, of this as well. We've got to um, challenge kids, especially, to imagine that what's going on around them. And this is an ex a little cool, cool exercise that we filmed also in San Diego. I hadn't realized I had so many San Diego slides, but a program called Kids in the Canyons. And these kids are asked to imagine themselves as another form of life, maybe a bird. What would that bird experience as they flew uh, through that canyon? What would it be like to be a bird? Um, monetizing awe, uh, another part of the strategy. And by that, I don't mean putting a price tag on, on lightning or, you know, that we maybe want to do that as well. Obviously, nature um, generates lots of economic value. But this idea that we maybe generate jobs and income for people who help us to be awe coaches. And this is a story from Stockholm, from Sweden. Sweden has this wonderful network of, of certified nature guides. So they earn a little money, they uh, set up a schedule, they meet people out at nature preserves, and it's a, a wonderful thing, a wonderful opportunity for people living in Stockholm to, to things that they can do over a weekend, and it generates a little income and money for the, the guides. Um, so I also believe that we've got to design awe into all of the spaces where we live. And this is a wonderful story uh, from this past summer. Um, it's a wildlife friendly development, a new development called Kingsbrook in the UK. I uh, got a chance to visit um, in June and they are doing things like incorporating swift boxes into every new home. And actually it's a, a company called Barrett uh, development. It's the l largest home builder in the UK, and they've committed now to incorporating swift boxes and, and um, other uh, wildlife elements into everything that they build from now on. And it's interesting that people coming by to buy these houses now, some of them are actually asking for swifts. They want swifts. And talk about a wondrous creature that travels thousands of miles migrating, uh, you know, high in the, high in the sky. Ne very rarely sleeping or coming down. It's a wondrous critter, to be sure. Um, another similar story that we uh, filmed over the summer from Santa Fe, a development called Aldea, where uh, the neighborhood has been activated to restore habitat for uh, this endangered uh, titmouse. Um, we've got to pull nature closer. We've got to have it around us. We've got to integrate it into everything we design and build. 
in the city. Last few slides um, make the point that the awe is induced by lots of things. Um, big things, of course, like whales. And many of us whale watch. We have a new film coming out soon about Gotham Whale, this nonprofit in New York City that's been getting folks out to whale watch. The number of um, whale sightings in the waters of New York, many of you know the story, has gone up dramatically. This has some implication for how we design and plan cities. Why is it? Well, when you clean the water um, and you ensure that the Menhaden uh, return, the whales come as well. So as, the, as Paul, who heads this, who started this nonprofit, tells us, t says on the film, people are on ferries now looking for whales. Um, and there are spontaneous moments of awe um, in, in, a, in a city uh, like New York. But it's also small things, little things. Miracles of minuteness. We've gotten to know Amy Savage, who is a, an ant expert, and she has done all this wonderful work um, inventorying the biodiversity of ants and median strips in the middle of New York City. And, uh, and part of this uh, thing called the School of Ants, uh, another citizen project, and among other things, they've prepared this urban ant diet. If you have trouble identifying species of ants, we all do, um, this is what you, what you need, and you can get it on your phone uh, as well. So um, I love this idea of cultivating practices of awe. How do we do that? These are images from our launch event uh, of our Biophilic Cities Network back in 2013, and we actually invited uh, Amy to come and be our resident entomologist for the four days. Um, that's not something that you commonly incorporate into a conference. And so her job was actually to go around the spaces around the School of Architecture, outside and inside, and collect ants and identify those ants. And so at certain times during the day, we sort of, we didn't have a bell to ring, but I'd make a big, a big you know, announcement and she would come down and say, we've discovered a new ant, <laughs> a new species of ant. And this was sort of, we had a board that had a running pallet of all those ants. So um, pay, paying attention to the little things. We also generated uh, <laughs> ant playing cards. <laughs> So we had five cards, and you, as an attendee at the conference, had to collect what well, you wanted to collect all five over the course of, I wonder if they still have these cards in their possession. Um, OK, how am I doing? Two minutes. Um, very quickly, other really great ideas. I don't have time to talk about a lot of them. I have 150 students right now going through a journaling, nature journaling exercise. We have a lot of evidence about the power of journaling, the therapeutic power of, of journaling, its ability to connect us to nature. This is one um, excerpt from one of my students. Just, just paying attention to birds and drawing them um, is an awe-inducing experience. I've had, uh, over the years, um, had this idea that whenever you uh, change your location, you move into a new flat, a new apartment, a new house, you ought to be given an ecolog ecological owner's manual. This is actually something out of an older book of mine called Native to Nowhere. Uh, we need to give folks the tools um, to know what is around them and to challenge them um, to, to learn more and to feel, in fact, um, wondrous and awe. I, I did this little test for my students. Um, the point here, language. Um, I do believe we need to do a better job being able to talk about, describe, put words to the wondrous things that happen around us in cities. So, my students, most of them didn't know what murmuration was, despite the fact that we have this massive flock of, of winter uh, robins, actually, that's, that's doing murmuration um, uh, throughout the downtown Charlottesville. It's really interesting. So I've uh, been arguing that we need better words um, to describe things. You know, what is it that that nut, nut hatch, how does it go up and down, upside down a you know, on a tree? We don't have a word for that that I'm aware of. Bark scooting, I don't know, it's not very good, but uh, you have to come up with your own, your own words. Uh, and this is my last slide, um, just 20 seconds um, to connect to the wonderful prayer uh, earlier. We had the chance to film in Western Australia, um, Noel Nanup, who is a, an elder in the Noongar um, and people of Western Australia indigenous uh, group. Uh, and they, of course, have been living for more than 60,000 years uh, in close contact uh, with nature. And uh, it's a massive period of time. And they, have, they are cultivating the awe. Uh, it's built into to their society and into their 
uh, into their world, and I want to learn and am inspired by them. So Noel talks about how at an early age, he um, is assigned or given his totem. And that totem for him was the bronze wing pigeon. And on camera, he talks in great detail about, for example, how the, the wing structure of this bird and how it, it keeps itself cool, uh, a, a level of of anatomical and biological detail that was astounding to me. But choosing that totem, you choose, that totem is, is, is given to you, and, and you might have multiple totems, but it's your responsibility to know everything about that uh, form of life and to be its advocate and to be its person who stands up and defends it. And so I was challenged after that interview. Um, I chose a black cockatoo. I don't have many opportunities to uh, stand up for black cockatoos, so it's terrible to watch uh, the bushfires. They have, have had a huge impact on them. Uh, but I think everybody needs to embrace this idea of choosing something, a few things that you learn a lot about, and you become its advocate, its defender. It's, uh, it's about awe. Uh, and so I think I'll stop there. My, my very last slide is, again, to reference and to send you to our biophiliccities.org webpage, as I haven't really told you much about the network and the concept of biophilic cities. Do learn more about it. I'm happy to, to talk to you um, in person about it. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.